Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte cancels a decades-old military agreement with the United States. We will take a look at what that means for both countries and the Asia-Pacific region. Hello, I'm Arnold Nidem and this is The Heat. Earlier this month, the Philippines sent a letter to the United States ending the Visitors, Visiting Forces Agreement, or VFA. That security pact allowed the presence of U.S. troops in the country for joint exercises and training, as well as cooperation in counterterrorism. The decision by Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte was announced after the United States canceled a visa for one of his political allies. Asked if scrapping the VFA was a knee-jerk reaction, Duterte claimed the Philippines should not need help from other countries to survive. Trump and others are trying to save the visiting forces agreement. I said I didn't want to. The Americans are very rude. So how will the cancellation reshape the balance of power in the region? To help me answer that, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Manila, Richard Haidarian is a columnist at the Philippine Daily Inquirer. From Beijing via Skype, Shindo Shu is a senior fellow at the Pangol Institution. Here in our studio, John Setalides is a geopolitical strategist with Trilogy Advisors, and Brian Becker is the executive director of the ANSWER Coalition. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Richard Hedarian, let me start with you. Uh, this agreement, the Visiting Forces Agreement, has really underpinned the military uh, relationship between the Philippines and the United States. So what impact is it going to have? Well, the Visiting Forces Agreement is not the treaty between the United States and the Philippines, but it's the operating system of the treaty. It provides a legal framework for the entry and rotational stationing and access of American troops. So that allows for tens of thousands of American troops to come to the Philippines for a full range of operations, whether humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations or counterterrorism, or more recently, joint war games and maritime security cooperations in the South China Sea. So without the Visiting Forces Agreement, you essentially could have an empty shell. As one top Filipino official said, the alliance will be practically useless if we don't have the Visiting Forces Agreement. That is why there are big questions about what is next for Philippine-U.S. alliance if, by August of this year, officially the Visiting Forces Agreement will be abrogated and there is no supplementary or transitional legal framework to cover for the entry and exit of American troops in Philippine soil for joint military activities. That's right, Richard. This uh, agreement, or the termination, rather, uh, will only take effect uh, in 180 days' time. Uh, Richard, how much support is there for this decision that President Duterte took? Well, we are still waiting for surveys that specifically ask questions about it. But from what we know, uh, based on different surveys domestically and internationally, they suggest that of course, the United States is very favorably viewed in the, uh, in the Philippines, while other countries like China, not as much. But at the same time, if you look at other surveys, like the Pew survey in 2017, or you look at the Pulse Asia survey in the Philippines in earlier years, it also suggests that while many Filipinos look favorably to, towards the United States, a large plurality of Filipinos also have questions whether America is a reliable ally. So there's a reliability deficit. The other important thing that is also happening here is that more and more Filipinos, in fact, more than 60% of Filipinos, according to the Pew Research Survey, are welcoming pragmatic engagement with China rather than confrontation with China. Because a lot of people who defend the alliance between Philippines and U.S., particularly the Visiting Forces Agreement, believe that you need the United States to check China's ambitions in the South China Sea. So it seems enough Filipinos are willing to give President Duterte a shot although they very favorably view United States. That's why we don't see massive popular backlash in the Philippines, at least not yet. John, the U.S. President Donald Trump, he has responded and reacted to this letter that the United States received, the letter of termination of this pact. Let's uh, listen to what the president had to say. I really don't mind if they would like to do that. That's fine. We'll save a lot of money. You know, my views are different than other people. I view it as, thank you very much, we save a lot of money. But if you look back, if you go back three years ago, when ISIS was overrunning the Philippines, we came in and literally single-handedly were able to save them from vicious attacks on their islands. The president does not seem very concerned by this, John. 
It's tough to tell what his long-term goals are here, Anand. Uh, to one extent, he did make a promise in 2016 to not only pull the U.S. out of what he called endless wars, but also to start to minimize the U.S. military footprint and look to see where there were significant savings from areas where he thought it wasn't absolutely necessary for the U.S. forces to be based and to focus now on great power competition with China, with Russia, and the like. So this could be part of that strategy where if he feels that it's not essential that we maintain this agreement with the Philippines and we save 200 to 250 million dollars that are expended right now in the Philippines, that could be the goal. The other part of it is this could be the Trumpian negotiations. There are six months or five and a half months to go and he's expressing indifference. Duterte has expressed indifference, if not indignance. And maybe this is the beginning of the negotiations between the, uh, Washington and Manila. But it's also, John, a question of optics, isn't it, uh, to have that agreement in place? Well, it depends on whether or not you think the optics are the most important part of the yeah. strategy right now. Again, if the goal is to have a better deal in place between the U.S. and the Philippines, mm -hmm. yes, push the envelope in every single direction. Trump has done this with a number of other foreign leaders, and Duterte is no different. Brian, what do you make of it? The United States has had a pretty robust uh, agreement, uh, military presence in the Philippines uh, that goes back decades. Well, it was a colonial relationship. Yeah. I mean, uh, the Philippines were seized by the United States in 1899. Um, the war that was uh, commenced in 1901, a large number of Filipinos died. The, the Philippines was a colony until 1946. Uh, then there was the Mutual Defense Treaty in 1951-52. Uh, that was in place until the late 1980s when masses of Filipino people demanded that Clark Air Base and Subic Bay Naval Base be shut down because they saw the bases as not only uh, a dominating uh, influence on, on Filipino life, but American soldiers were granted impunity when they committed crimes. There was prostitution, drugs, all the problems associated with a large-scale military base. And in 1992, the, the Philippine Senate demanded that the U.S. get out. So the Visiting Forces Agreement replaced the earlier Mutual Defense Treaty after a lapse of seven years. That allowed the, the, the American presence to come back into the Philippines while maintaining the fiction that it's not a permanent military base by having rotating troops. For this to end now, 21 or 22 years later, would be major. It would be, uh, you can't overstate the, the impact, in fact. And of course, the U.S. military and the Philippine military, I'm not talking about Duterte, mm -hmm. have this constant working together. They're basically embedded with each other. Yeah. And so I think the, the U.S. military will work with its allies within the Philippine military to try to undermine uh, Duterte's decision. John? I think it's a very important point about the military is looking to see how they get this back on track and look to see that the VFA is not completely abrogated come August. But you also have important political leaders. And to the earlier panelist point out of the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, the foreign secretary, Mr. Teddy Loxon, is also very much concerned about President Duterte's decision. And whether it's in his social media feeds and his public statements in the Philippines, he's looking to see how this agreement can be fixed rather than abrogated. So you've got widespread concern around Duterte. Again, the next six months could be very uncertain in terms of how this ends. Right, let's go to Shindo Shu in Beijing. Uh, Shindo Shu, the United States Defense Secretary, Mark Esper, he was recently in the Philippines a few months ago. He says the termination of this agreement is a move in the wrong direction. And he described it, in his words, as a gift to China. How will Beijing be viewing this? Well, for Beijing, this is a domestic decision uh, by Manila. You know, uh, they would talk, uh, say this is about uh, gaining back their independence and sovereignty. Uh, they are a sovereign country, so they want to uh, make decisions for themselves about their future, about their defense. I think that's understandable. Uh, look at, uh, you know, regional countries like Malaysia. Uh, like other regional countries, they don't have a defense agreement with the United States, and they, you know, uh, they are on their own. So that's they are perfectly fine. Uh, I understand, of course, you know, people would say this is, uh, you know, uh, Philippine, United States, and China. Uh, this is a triangle relationship, or rather, uh, China, U.S. Uh, you know, uh, the big power relationship here about Southeast Asia, etc. Uh, but look, the U.S. has been pushing. Uh, for this uh, Indo-Pacific strategy uh, with a target at China, obviously. I think it's understandable. For Philippines, they would say, uh, the Philippines, they would say, we don't want to be a chess piece in your confrontation with China, in your containment with China, uh, because if there's anything goes wrong, uh, 
we will be the, uh, directly hit by the Chinese side, and well, uh, you will maybe behind our back. But uh, if you want to, like, uh, you know, uh, have a dispute with China, go ahead, do it yourself. I don't want to be played. So that's uh, our understanding. Probably there's a, a such kind of consideration on the side of Manila. Richard, uh, does the Philippines see it that way, that they are chess piece in this big power rivalry that we see in that part of the world, and they don't want to be in it, a part of that? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, does the Philippines see it the way that uh, Shindo Shu was just describing, that it's become a bit of a, a chess piece in big power rivalry in Southeast Asia, in that part of the world, and it doesn't want to be a chess piece? Well, as far as the Duterte administration is concerned, there's a deep worry about the U.S.-China rivalry in this part of the world going out of control. In fact, uh, the argument that we hear, including from the defense minister of the Philippines, uh, Delphine Lorenzana, who was a former uh, veterans attache in Washington, D.C., is that we don't want to get involved in any kind of superpower rivalry, that our Turkey alliance with the United States could actually be a liability for the Philippines. So actually, uh, in late 2018, he called already for the review of the alliance. So what we see with President Duterte going forward and threatening to effectively end the visiting forces agreement is a continuation of a long-running set of questioning by including members of the Philippine military and Philippine defense establishment who are supposed to be pro-American, that this alliance could be more liability rather than benefit. Nonetheless, we still have until August. There could be, again, an 11th hour plot twist here. But the, uh, and there are a number of things to look at. First of all, the Philippine Senate is questioning whether this is constitutional to begin with because they're asking for a formal review, and they're saying that the Philippine Senate needs a concurrence, that Duterte cannot unilaterally abrogate the Visiting Forces Agreement. So the Philippine Supreme Court could still turn the events. The other thing that we also have to keep in mind is this. President Duterte is effectively calling for a quid pro quo. Uh, I think he made it very clear a few weeks ago when he said that I want the visa of one of his chief allies, uh, Senator Bato de la Rosa, to be restored if you want to keep the visiting forces agreement. Now, he didn't mean it perhaps literally or narrowly as that. What is the concern of President Duterte here, and this is less about the Philippines perhaps, it's more about the uh, political elite in the Philippines, is that he fears that in the coming months and years, not only the United States, but more and more countries will impose sanctions against his inner circle and against himself, not only travel ban, but potentially asset freeze and other kind of punitive measures. That is why President Duterte is taking this not only in terms of having a more independent foreign policy for the Philippines, but he's taking this as a direct assault on his democratic mandate and also as a direct uh, assault on his private interests and the interests of his inner circle as he enters his twilight years in office. That's why I do not see a very clear picture here. Uh, it, I, I don't see how the United States can give the necessary concessions to President Duterte for him to change his mind. But what I think is clear is that internally within the Philippine government and in the society, there are going to be conversations about how to keep the alliance alive while Duterte and United States and other Western countries quibble about human rights issues. John, do we have a bit of a standoff here? Uh, we may. Uh, the gentleman raises two very important points that I'd like to underscore, and one is that because President Duterte is known as a, quite the impulsive leader, uh, there is an immediate context for this, and that's the U.S. government's cancellation of the visa of the, the Filipino senator who's playing a very prominent role in the uh, anti-drug campaign in the Philippines that many critics believe has led to hundreds if not thousands of vigilante deaths of Filipino citizens. And there's also the fear of Magnitsky-type sanctions right. against a Filipino senator who's being detained currently. So I think that's an important part of President Duterte's reaction to U.S. policies. But to your question, I don't know if the Philippines have a choice but to be a chess piece in what is now an increasingly pronounced Chinese fear of influence in the South China Sea. Now, they may decide to seek strategic depth move away from the U.S. relationship because they consider that a liability in the relationship with China. But you also have Russia now that is looking to establish small arms factories and to provide for support militarily for the, uh, for the Philippines and, and provide additional strategic depth so that there's a diversification of national security considerations for the Philippines. U.S., China, and Russia, sort of a second level there. So uh, this is the way geopolitics is playing out in a very different, more complex and dangerous global environment of the last five to seven years.
Brian, I mean, how important uh, or how significant is it that President Duterte has decided to tear up this agreement? Because the United States continues to maintain a very big and strong presence in that part of the world. It's got uh, bases in South Korea. It's got a base in Guam. It's got a base in Japan. The Seventh Fleet is headquartered in Japan as well. Uh, still very, very important because the Philippines is a historic relationship. And, and it wouldn't simply be the United States being forced out of the visiting forces agreement with the Philippines. It's also about the orientation of the Philippines. Does it start to veer away from the United States, which is not really an ally so much as a dominating force? You may call it an alliance, but you know one side has a great deal more power than the other side. If the Philippines starts to move away, as Duterte, even though there may be impulsivity, Duterte has signaled this over and over again, this s desire to not be hitched to the United States and to be able to see uh, China as another equal player with the United States in that part of the world. Now, just remember, in 2011, when President Obama announced from Australia the Asia pivot, uh, shortly thereafter, the then Philippine government went to The Hague and, and challenged uh, Chinese sovereignty over uh, uh, islands in the South China Sea. Uh, soon, and The Hague ruled on behalf of the Philippines. And the United States and the Philippines were touting it. Duterte came in and said, uh, not really a big deal. We're not going to have The Hague settle uh, relations between the Philippines and China. That was clearly uh, an indicator that President Duterte was taking a different path. Yes, he has a sort of uneven record. There's a maverick quality about yeah. him. There's a contradictory element. But this is not one incident. This is a pattern uh, signaling that Duterte actually wants to reorganize the relationships between the United States and the Philippines, between the Philippines and China, and thus sort of exempt the country from being seen as just one country's pawn in the geostrategic chessboard. Right. Shindo Shu, uh, how would you characterize the current relationship between the Philippines and China? Uh, China is the top trading partner. There's a lot of trade between these two countries. But beyond that, the strategic relationship, what does that look like? Uh, well, if you look at uh, the relationship between Beijing and Manila, uh, mostly it's about the trade relationship. Uh, I wouldn't call it uh, like uh, the, in the strategic sense. Uh, but look, uh, before uh, Duterte became uh, took office in 2016, the Chinese investment in the Philippines is about like six, uh, six, uh, 60 million uh, US dollars. Uh, but over the past three of to four years, you can see that has increased to one billion U.S. dollars of Chinese investment in infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, we know uh, there's a program under uh, President uh, Duterte that is called you know, Build, Build, Build. Uh, so that resist, uh, received a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, investment from the Chinese side. And also, it's close, let's say. There are a lot of Chinese visitors, Chinese uh, uh, tourists to uh, the Philippines. So that's another source of revenue. And remember, you know, we are neighbors, and we will be permanent uh, in that sense, geographically. Uh, you know, ge uh, geographically, we will be permanent neighbors. And uh, yes, there's dispute between China and the Philippines, but the two countries are trying to solve their problem, or uh, one way or another, uh, through peaceful discussions. So there's no point of confrontation. Uh, and I think. Uh, Manila side understand that uh, you know they don't want to say confront China because China is way more powerful. Let's say uh, that's the reality, and also we know the U.S. presence in Manila is not about uh, protecting the Philippines alone, say or fighting the terrorists in the southern side of this country. Um, uh, look, uh, you know, even without uh, ally, uh, other countries can of course live on themselves. So look at uh, Vietnam, look at Indonesia, look at uh, Malaysia. So who says? Uh, a country in this region, they must need the protection of the United States. Protection against whom? Uh, you know, this uh, this agreement is back went back to, to uh, you know, decades uh, uh, back in 1998 or even before that mutual defense agreement. So this kind of agreement or treaty, uh, it's not only about the bilateral relationship, but it's about targeting another country, that's China, for example. But for China, you know, uh, it requires peace and stability to do business. Uh, is that's in the interest of the Chinese side, but also in the interest of ASEAN countries, uh, of which uh, Philippines is a is a member of uh, of the group. Uh, so uh, in that sense, of course, you know, but that's a sovereign decision for Philippines. You, you know, that's their consideration. What's the best for their interests? China respects, you know, whatever decision coming out of Manila.
Richard Hadarian, it will be some time before this uh, decision takes effect. Uh, but in that time, I mean, what kind of pushback uh, could you see from the Philippines military? You pointed out that the defense minister is not altogether happy with the president's decision. Mm -hmm. But what about the Philippines, uh, the top military commanders? Could there be pushback from them? Well, one thing that we have to keep in mind is that since President Duterte took office, one of the institutions in the country that he really launched a charm offensive towards was the military. Uh, in the first three months of his office, I think he visited like 45 different military bases across the country. He has doubled or tripled the benefits, the salaries of soldiers and officers. Uh, a lot of people who used to serve in Davao, uh, where of course President Duterte comes from, uh, became AFP chiefs of staff. So over the past three or four years, I think President Duterte, being a quite an experienced politician, he realized that he has to have the good graces of the military if ever he's going to shake up the Philippines' alliance with the United States, which is exactly what's happening right now. At the same time, I think there are a lot of people in the military, but outside the military establishment, who are also concerned about the ramifications of a potential abrogation of the Visiting Forces Agreement. Because, you see, this is not only about China, this is not only about the South China Sea, but a whole host of non-traditional, traditional security issues. The United States has been very helpful to the Philippines. You cannot compare the Philippines to Malaysia or Vietnam or Indonesia, because the Philippines, from the very DNA of the Republic, from the moment that it was established, it was already under the shadow of the United States. So the way its security doctrine has been established, the way its armed forces have developed and their doctrines is very much tethered to America. So it cannot just be independent over time. The hope of many people was perhaps over the next five to ten years as the Philippines invests more in its own defensive capabilities, it can have less reliance on the United States without necessarily completely cutting off that kind of alliance. That was the hope of a lot of people. So the argument against President Duterte is that this was perfunctory and this is premature. Now, to, again, to put things into context, the VFA was very important. For instance, it facilitated 13,000 American troops, 66 aircrafts, and an aircraft carrier to come to the Philippines and help tens of thousands of people who were desperately out of touch of Filipino troops and Filipino government during the Yolanda or Haiyan superstorm in 2013. During the Marawi crisis in 2017, when ISIS-affiliated elements took siege of the town for five months, the armed forces of the Philippines had very limited to non-existent experience of conducting urban warfare against 21st century terrorism. Yeah. America provided the special forces training, high-grade weaponry. So the military, even if they will be okay with engagement with China, they're going to worry about how are they going to deal with all sorts of problems which are non-traditional security. Right. The Philippines is very vulnerable to all of them. I think that's where President Duterte could be uh, significantly criticized. John? Uh, Shinto raised earlier the uh, context of the ASEAN, uh, multilateral agreements and institutions in Southeast Asia. Well, it's interesting that President Trump is going to be convening a uh, gathering of the ASEAN countries here in the United States in March, had extended the invitation to President Duterte. He turned down that invitation. So we'll see how uh, immediate negotiations possibly relaunch a, an opportunity for Duterte to rethink his rejection, come to the United States, and see whether or not there's a first discussion to be had directly with President Trump. And again, in the context of ASEAN, I think you may see, if this doesn't work out by August, there will be efforts by countries such as Indonesia, Vietnam, and maybe even Singapore to reach out to, to the United States and see if a similar type of agreement or even stronger ones than they currently enjoy with the United States for basing or for forward deployment of U.S. troops and the like in the South China Sea come into place to succeed what may be the abrogation finally of this U.S.-Philippine VFA. Brian, during the, uh, when President Obama was president, uh, he talked about the so-called pivot to Asia. We also talk, heard about uh, the rebalancing of U.S. military assets around the world, that more assets would be shifted to that part of the world. Would this uh, affect that in any way? Well, I think so. I mean, I think the United States is counting on the Philippines as an anchor. Uh, I mean, it, it was driven out of the Philippines. Again, I want to just emphasize, the Filipino people drove the U.S. military bases out such that the Senate had to vote in 1992 to close down Subic Bay and Clark Air Base. So the U.S. came back and it urgently wanted to come back with this fiction that it was no longer a permanent military presence, that it was just rotating. Mm -hmm. But it's critical to U.S. military operations in that part of the Pacific. The, the Asia pivot calls for, by this year, by 2020, 60% of all U.S. naval and Air Force assets to be in this part of the world. 
uh, the Philippines has for a long time been considered to be an anchoring force for the American presence. I just want to say one more thing about the, uh, the, the agreement. It smacks of colonialism still. It still offers Americans, American troops immunity. It requires immunity and impunity. It has that extraterritoriality clause that if American soldiers rape or kill Filipinos, they're still under the jurisdiction of, of the American military. An agreement like this, coming as it did after the Filipino people had wrote, risen up and said no to these big bases, it offends the sensibility of sovereignty. It offends the sensibility of sovereignty. And Duterte, by, by making this position, also makes it clear that he's representing Filipino aspirations to be a proud, dignified people and not to be under the thumb of a foreign dominating power. So from a political point of view, I think it plays well for him, and it also resonates or must resonate with a significant part of the population. Richard, what do you make of those points that the United States can send its troops to the Philippines and they can pretty much do whatever they want to? Is this question to me? Sorry. Yeah, that was to you. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? Sorry again. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, I was just going to, uh, I was referring to uh, Brian's points about the United, and you know, under this agreement, it seems to be one-sided, as Brian was pointing out. The United States can send its troops to the Philippines, uh, and they can pretty much do whatever they want to. They have immunity. Uh, they can act with impunity. Um, and the fact that mm. what President Duterte has done was basically, it's a political act to re regain Philippine sovereignty. Well, let's be very clear. The Philippines' alliance with the United States is controversial, at least among a small plurality of Filipinos. And when you had incidents of American servicemen uh, visiting violence, or in some cases murdering uh, Filipino uh, citizens, uh, and the visiting forces agreement essentially giving a cover to them by not allowing the Philippine judicial institutions to take care of the situation, right. you had a lot of controversy and a lot of backlash, right? So I think a lot of people are arguing that the visiting forces agreement is imperfect, it could be better negotiated, but yeah. first of all, it has to be properly reviewed. So the criticism against Duterte is that why did he jump right away to abrogating it without going okay. through a formal process of review? But then again, maybe behind the scenes, President Duterte wants to make a different kind of negotiation all right. and pu push for the changes in VFA. But all right, lastly, I'll, I'll make this very clear. Very quick, There's very another quick. defense agreement, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, yeah. which will allow the Americans supposedly to gain access to key bases close to the South China Sea. Okay. Now, that agreement cannot also be properly implemented if you don't have the VFA. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. Thanks for being with us. We launch our own podcast. You can listen to it through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. We'll be covering stories from around the world similar to those you see on this program, but we'll get a bit more personal and candid with our guests and correspondents. So if you're on the go, whether on the train, driving to work, or just out for a run, give us a listen and make sure to subscribe. Search online for CGTN and The Heat Podcast.